Well, welcome everybody. This is the uh, last installation of uh, optimization Oslo of the year. Um, we're happy today to have uh, Johannes Mitz from the TU Munich, but in about two weeks time from uh, Georgia Tech. And he's going to be talking about uh, consistency of Monte Carlo estimators for risk neutral PDE constraint optimization. Right. Thank you very much, Thomas, uh, for the invite and for the opportunity to speak to you today. So I want to give a very brief introduction to simulinear PDE constraint optimization. So the starting point in simulinear PDE constraint optimization is the simulinear PDE. So given a control, our task is to compute a PDE solution um, as of two, which depends on our control, and the output is of the simulations are a PDE solution. And in simulinear PDE constraint optimization, we want to make the best decision given a certain criteria, which is our objective function. And in this case, it's a standard tracking type objective function, which consists of minimizing the misfit of our PDE solution to YD, which is a desired state. Then we have a control irregularizer and a function psi that we can use to model constraints, for example, or sparsity. Um, in risk-neutral semilinear PDE constraint optimization, we have a parameterized semilinear PDE as a starting point. So our REN or our diffusion coefficient kappa is actually a random function. So it's parameterized by some parameters, psi j in our case, and these are random variables. So now for a fixed control, the solution to our PDE parameter, similar PDE, depends on its parameters. So depending on how I choose them, I get different PDE states. And then to make a decision optimal, we formulate a risk neutral semilinear PDE constraint optimization problem. So instead of minimizing just the uh, misfit basically between the solution, PDE solution at the desired state, we apply the expected value operator. Okay. And uh, solutions to these optimization problems are sort of best on average. Okay. And so for the most part of this talk, we will focus on this a semilinear PDE constraint optimization problem, and we require that this alpha, this control regularizer, is a positive number. And this psi here um, is a random vector in our case, and it takes values in a complete separable metric space. So in most cases, it's a vector that takes values in some closed set in R. And these uh, problems are challenging. One reason being, for example, that even for a fixed u and xi, um, there is no solution formula for the, for the PDE. Okay. Um, and also, it may happen that this expected value um, is governed by a high dimensional integral. Okay. So, in order to compute approximate solutions to it, what we will do is the approximate is expected value by a sample average. And um, this way we obtain a discretization of our risk neutral problem. And the solutions to these discretizations are estimators to the true problem or to the solutions to the true problem. So, and this specific approximation of the expected value is known in the literature as sample average approximation. And yeah, what we do is we replace the expected value by a sample average. It's basic mean estimation, basically. And these xi i's that we use are iid uh, copies of our random vector. And n here is the sample size. And the nice thing about this discretization approach is that uh, these SAA problems, they're standard PDE constraint optimization problems, so they, they can be solved by any uh, solver that is able to solve standard PDE constraint optimization problems. 
And um, the talk's goals are to demonstrate the consistency of the SAA optimal values and SAA optimal solutions to their true counterparts. So I will tell you in a, just a few seconds what I mean by that. Okay. And the a more graphical illustration of what we are interested in is as follows. So on the left, um, you can see an SAA solution with sample size equal to one, and on the right, a SAA solution with sample size about 1,000, which is our reference solution. And as we increase the sample size on the left, we see that we somewhat approach our reference solution on the right. And we want to provide some insights for why this is the case, why we observe convergence. And uh, the, I will also show numerical simulations for another optimization problem. And uh, the setting I use is always the same. So I simulate PDEs using Phoenix. I do derivative computations using Dolphin and Joint. And um, I solve all the optimization problems using the same as Newton method. And its implementation is uh, built on, on that of Mola's Newton CK method. So the outline of this talk is to uh, review a general or rather general framework for consistency analysis for risk mutual problems. Then we will apply this to our semilinear PD constraint problem uh, and use this to, to derive a rather general framework for consistency analysis. And then we will apply this to two further model problems. Um, so, before we do that, I want to talk a little bit about what has been done in the literature so far. Um, and uh, this literature review is only for Monte Carlo sample based approximations. So, there are also uh, quasi Monte Carlo approaches, for example, or uh, quadrature approximations to expected um, radio operators. Um, but for Monte Carlo random sample based approximations, there's literature on consistency. So consistency uh, means asymptotic statements as we increase the sample size to infinity. And um, there's work on the risk neutral case and on the risk averse. Okay. And risk averse means a problem formulations where uh, instead of the expected value operator, we have some more general functional. And they tend to be more difficult to analyze because they're inherently non-smooth, for example. And there's also uh, work on complexity of risk neutral PD constraint optimization problems. And by complexity, I mean uh, non-asymptotic statements on how large the sample size should be in order to have some um, accuracy guarantee, for example. Um, but by complexity, I also mean central limit type theorems uh, this is what I what I uh, call complexity. And here it uh, it seems to be, yeah, the the approaches so far known uh, differ from convex problems and non for non-convex problems. Um, yeah, broader or literature on an analysis of sample-based approximations for, for risk-neutral problems or problems under uncertainty. Uh, or if you want to analyze these sample-based approximations, then there are sort of three main approaches. There might be more uh, to analyze such sample-based approximations. And one uh, uses uniform convergence or uniform law of large numbers. This will be the approach uh, that we will use today. Um, and I will talk um, yeah, um, how, how a uniform law of large numbers uh, provide us with consistency guarantees. Um, the second approach uses epiconvergence, an epigraphical law of large numbers. This is an approach, um, some, yeah, it's actually very different from uniform law of large numbers, but we won't talk about it. And there's also approaches using probability. And some of these approaches even provide much more than just uh, 
consistency statements. So they provide also complexity statements. Um, so now I want to talk about um, how consistency can be established for um, a class of um, optimization problems. And this class of optimization problem includes uh, the ones we are interested in today. So in particular, this semilinear belief constraint problem. There are risk neutral problems. So the problem on the left, which I call a true problem, it's sometimes also called actual problem. On the right, we have our SAA approximation. And now I list a couple of assumptions that will yield consistency. And these assumptions will be verified for our uh, semilinear PDE constraint optimization problem. And so the first one is, so U is a separable Hilbert space. It can also be a Banach space. It doesn't matter too much. But what is important for us is that we are given a compact subset of our potentially infinite dimensional space. And we have uh, three, we impose three conditions on this compact subset. So um, this phi psi here is allowed, or we use this psi here to model constraints, for example. So it should be proper and lower semi-continuous. And we require this compact subset to be a subset or to be contained in the domain of psi. Okay. Uh, this, this is an okay assumption. And then we require that the true problem solution set, so the problem on the left, by right, its solution set is contained in this compact subset. Okay. Uh, this um, is, and we will ver verify this later for, for our problem. And then we require the same uh, for the SAA problem. So we require that its solution set is contained in this compact subset. Um, but here we require the statement to hold probability one because the solution set of the SAA problem is actually random. So it depends on, on the random sample generated. And then we have two mild assumptions on our objective functions or the integrand. So this f, it should be a Carrier Dory map and it should be integral in a suitable sense. And this is a very mild assumption. And then we, uh, we take an IID sample. Okay. And using these uh, assumptions, we already get consistency. So meaning the SIA optimal radius, so we uh, sub n star converges with probability one to v star, and uh, the SAA solutions converge with probability one to the solution set of the true problem. And I will uh, define this, this or what it means in, in just uh, a few slides. Okay, so given these set of assumptions, um, we obtain the consistency of this approach. Um, yeah, the only issue that we generally have in infinite dimensions that compact sets are very rare usually, uh, but that's okay for us. Okay, and I wanna talk a little bit how we obtain consistency of the SAA optimal values. So the main step is the uniform law of large numbers. It's like a law of large numbers, but uh, in uniform law of large number, we are allowed to take a soup over u and c. So in the law of large numbers, you would just have a fixed u, and then you would have a statement that this uh, sample average car converges to the true expected value. And uniform law of large numbers gives you a uniform statement, but it's important that uh, this com set c is a compact one. And then uh, we assumed that the true problem solution set is contained in this compact set. So we can write the optimal value V star um, is equal to minimizing this expectation plus psi over our compact set. Okay. And we can do the same for the SAA problem with probability one, because we also assumed that uh, the SAA solutions are contained in this compact sets. Okay. And if we combine these two uh, observations, or actually three observations, then we already obtain consistency. 
So we can write that the difference of the optimal values as the supremum of this long formula here. And I'm allowed to squeeze in psi because we assume that's finite values on our compact set. So the uniform law of large numbers tells us that this, um, this bound here converges to zero with probability one. So this already gives us consistency of the optimal values. And then uh, consistency of SAA solutions means that if you're given solutions to the SAA problems, uh, then with probability one, this distance here converges to zero. And this distance is, uh, so this of u n star to s is the distance from, from this point u n star to the true problem solution set. Okay, so to the points that are closest to the solution set of the true problem. So this is what I mean by consistency of SAA solution. It can actually be uh, uh, be generalized, but that's okay for this talk. And how can we establish uh, this convergence to zero? So you may, for example, use a proof by contradiction or show that every subsequence of the sequence converges to zero. Okay. And this also exploits the compactness of the set. So this um, is a very important assumption here. Okay. And um, now for infinite dimensional problems, uh, we, we, we have at least one challenge. So what, one is that feasible sets uh, tend to be non-compact. So um, in particular, feasible sets for PE constraint optimization problems are generally non-compact. And a very, um, yeah, very uh, common example of a feasible set is what I call a box constraint set. So you have L2 functions and they're allowed to take values between minus one and one. And this set is non-compact. And one reason for it to be non-compact is it contains uh, the sequence phi k here. And the sequence does not have an accommodation point. Okay? And why is that? So um, if you have a look at a couple of graphs of this function, then we see that uh, this function or this, the members of the sequence are highly oscillatory. Okay? And um, this sort of graphically at least uh, illustrates the non-compactness of the set. Um, if we have a look at our SAA solutions, uh, all of them, I just show one here, uh, then we observe uh, a distinct feature. So these solutions tend to be not oscillatory. Okay. Um, this is a, yeah, just a graphical illustration. So, in order to apply this frame, this consistency framework I've mentioned earlier, what we should do is construct a compact set with these properties that I've mentioned. And what we will be doing is formalizing the statement that solutions are not oscillatory. This is what we do. Okay. So we, yeah, we formalize this, this graphical um, observation here. And uh, to do so, I will uh, list the similar PE constraint problem uh, using, yeah, stating all the technical assumptions. So this is the problem we had a look at earlier. Um, the PDE here is written in weak form. This will be um, somewhat important uh, to us. And then we have, yeah, uh, the computational domain is, is bounded. Um, the random diffusion coefficient, this kappa here, is assumed to be uniformly bounded. So its evaluations are bounded below by some constant and bounded from above by some constant by kappa max. And then uh, the psi, so the example I've also used for the numerical simulations is a function that whenever u is between a and b and a and b are scalars, then we obtain a scale L1 norm and otherwise it's plus infinity. Um, so it's, it's uh, basically an indicator function of the, 
of, of our box constraint set plus the scaled and one norm. And for our construction, it will be important that the domain of this function is bounded. So this is um, a useful observation. So for this consistency analysis, we will construct this compact set. Um, and this compact set will contain a true problem solution set and a DSA in problem solution set. And uh, for this construction, we use, yeah, about four tools. So one is hidden compactness. So um, PDE constraint optimization problems have some problem structure and then we will be exploiting. Then we have stability estimates that are typical for PDE. So PDE stability estimates, uh, there will be some gradient computation involved and optimality conditions. And if we combine these, uh, so we, I will walk you through all these, these tools and then this compact subset will actually be very natural. It will just pop out of these uh, computations. And I will illustrate this now on, on the similar PE constraint problem. So the first one is recognizing some, how I like to call it, hidden compactness of our problem structure. And so we have a look at our semilinear PDE and in particular how U enters. So our control, our decision enters the semilinear PDE. And this is uh, in a linear way. And this V is a test function out of H10 and U is an L2 function. So uh, we can actually write the right hand side as an evaluation of a mapping B. And this mapping takes um, our decisions to um, functions in the dual space of H10. Um, yeah. And um, this operator is defined by just returning the inner product of U times V. And uh, it's a joint operator is actually very well known. So um, the joint operator of E, so the E star is the embedding operator from H1, zero to L2. So we know that this is a compact operator. So B and B star are compact operators. And this is where I, I, I took the word hidden compactness from. Um, yeah, because usually, um, B is not made explicit in, in such uh, problem formulations. And then um, using this definition of B, we may write our PDE in, in this somewhat more uh, uh, technical form, but now we have made some compactness or revealed some compactness using this compact operator. So this is the first step. Then the second one is stability estimates. Um, so the first a stability estimate is a state stability estimate, and it tells us um, how large the norm of the state is, um, dependent on the norm of our input, the control. And here is just a uh, constant times times the norm of, of U and L2. And here we have our kappa min appearing, and this constant CD is just the Friedrich's constant of the domain sometimes called also one cutting constant. And then there, for, there's also a joint state. The joint state appears in the derivative computation and it also obeys some um, stability estimate. The precise form is um, not too important for us. Um, we will combine these two stability estimates to obtain the following one. So we know that the domain of psi is bounded and combining these two stability estimates, we can find a radius so that all evaluations of these joint states are in a ball about zero with radius r, okay? Just by combining these, these two estimates. So now we compute gradients of the smooth part of the, our objective function. So if we compute the, the gradient of our expectation function, then we obtain an expression that involves B star and the expected value of our joint state. And for the expected value of our joint state, we know that uh, this is in a ball about zero with radius 
uh, R. And it should be an H10 number here. I'm sorry. Okay. And similarly for um, the sample average approximation of our expectation function, we also have um, our operator V star appearing and the sample average of the adjoint states. Okay. And we know that the norm of uh, this the sample average here is bounded by R. So now we just need to have a look at our chemality conditions and then we will uh, find our compact subset. So if you're given a solution to our risk neutral PD constraint problem, then we have such an identity. So it tells us that U is related, is equal to the prox um, proximity operator of some expression. And um, this expression involves our operator B star. And for us, it's not really important what the proximity operator is for this particular case. Um, it's just important that this proximity operator actually yields this fixed point type equation, and we will need that it is a continuous function. And we have the same optimality condition for the SAA problem. So if you're given um, a, a solution to the SAA problem, then we also have this fixed point type equation. And using yeah, all the computations we have done so far, it is somewhat natural to define this compact set in this form. So it um, is um, it contains evaluations of the proximity operator. We have this one over alpha, then we have B star and C, and the norm of C is bounded by R. And if we have a look at um, these fixed point type equations and the computations we have done on the previous slide, we know that uh, this expected value here and the sample average are yeah, such that its norm is H10 norm is less than or equal to R. So we know that the set contains U star and U and star. And why is it compact? So um, it has three reasons. Um, this mapping B star is a compact operator and it's defined on a Hilbert space. So it maps H10 functions to L2 and any such compact operator maps closed and bounded sets to compact ones. And images of continuous functions of a compact set is compact. Um, so this is a compact set. Okay. So it's the image of, of a continuous function and the proximity operator is a continuous function. So this is a compact set and it contains the solutions and um, so uh, just a, su a quick summary. So um, we have found our compact set. This compact set contains our uh, the solutions to the true problem and the solutions to the SAA problem. Um, and using the stability estimates I've shown you earlier, we can also show that um, our um, objective function, so this J hat is, is our reduced parameterized objective function, and this is dominated by some integrable random function, random variable. But this is something that we also need to verify in a finite dimensional uh, setting. So I, I don't go into that. And using this construction, we obtain a consistency of SAA optima values and SAA solutions. Okay. And um, for this consistency, it was what we have exploited actually is a regularity of the gradient that appears to be the case for many PD constraint optimization problems. So a J hat is, is our reduced parameterized objective function and we have computed this gradient earlier and we found that it is a minus B uh, times the adjoint state. So, um, so this gradient is the, the image of, um, so it's, uh, we obtain the gradient by evaluating B star 
at H10 elements. And VSTAR is just the embedding operator um, from H10 to L2, so it's like the identity mapping. This is why it's sometimes called um, higher regularity of the gradient. So this is an important um, observation that led us uh, to allow to construct this compact set. And this problem structure that we have been exploiting so far, this is also used in many different branches in PD constraint optimization, for example, in algorithmic development, in particular mesh independent of, of Newton methods, semi-smooth Newton methods also. And it's also used to establish higher regularity of solutions. So what I mean by that is um, generally if, if we pose, if our feasible set is a subset of L2, we cannot expect this function to be more regular, for example, uh, in H1, okay? But for this, for this particular semilinear PDE constraint optimization problem, it's actually possible to show that the solutions have bounded derivatives. So these are actually H1 functions. Okay, and, um, and this is used, for example, to establish final element error estimates. So this is um, very widely used as problem structure. And the next step is to discuss a somewhat uh, general framework um, for consistency analysis. And um, what we do now is these four steps that we have been using uh, to, to derive this compact subset, we will uh, formalize it into a framework. And the most critical part will be uh, to have an identity, which I like to call a gradient identity, as shown in the first equation on the slide. So that um, our gradient is the image of a compact operator in some sense. And um, so a somewhat um, rather general risk neutral PDE constraint optimization problem, we take the following form. So um, here we allow inside of, of the expectation a more general function than this uh, tracking type term we have used so far. And it's modeled by this chain here. Uh, we also, or we still require that alpha is a positive scalar. And then um, here we allow for more general PDE. So written in, in an abstract form um, as a quality constraint, essentially. Um, then our control space is a Hilbert space or separable Hilbert space. And Y is the state space. So the PDE solutions live in this Y and it should be a Banach space. And this capital J here so should be a smooth function and then Psi has like standard properties. It's uh, proper closed and convex and can be used to model constraints. And so what we do is we define our use parameterized objective function. And then there are a few technical assumptions. Um, so this domain of this function Psi should be bounded. That's very helpful to define a compact set. Um, and then for each uh, xi, uh, this reduced parameterized objective function should be differentiable in order to apply our uh, optimality conditions. And now here comes this a gradient identity we have seen for the special case of semilinear problems. So we require the existence of a compact operator that maps from a Banach space to our decision space, to our control space. And we also suppose we are given a function M, um, which should be a Karadori map. And in such a way that the gradient of this reduced parameterized objective function is equal to evaluations of K at M of U and Xi. Okay. And then, um, yeah, to apply, for example, uniform law of large numbers, we also need some integrable, uh, integrable uh, random variable in the sense that 
um, norms of this mapping M are bounded uh, for all U out of our domain by Xi. Okay. Center of Xi. And in our semi-linear control problem, this K was just minus um, V star, and V star was just the embedding operator, so basically the identity mapping. And M uh, was just the adjoint state. Okay. Um, and these are the main assumptions needed in order to construct a compact set. Okay. And these are the main assumptions that we need uh, in order to analyze the consistency of, of infinite dimensional problems. So I will now apply this framework to two further model problems. And I will just focus on basically um, how we obtain this gradient identity. So how can we reveal this compact operator K? Because it's the most important ingredient. And uh, the first um, application is boundary, is a boundary control problem. Um, it's very similar to the semi-linear PDE constraint problem discussed earlier, but now our decision space is not the uh, two functions defined on the domain, but only on the boundary. Um, and the semi-linear PDE is, is very similar. Um, now I pose it over H1 and not H10. Um, and also, um, yeah, as, as for, the, for the first example, the, the control enters linearly into the PDE. And what's a little bit special about uh, boundary control problems is that um, and there appears to trace operator. It's usually not made explicit, but it's helpful for us to recognize this hidden compactness. So I've, I'm, I'm explicitly writing down um, this, this tau operator, which is just a trace operator. And um, yeah, we require a little bit more in our domain. It should be a bounded Lipschitz domain. And we have the same assumptions on the random diffusion coefficient and um, standard assumption on this function psi. Um, now, how can we recognize this gradient identity or this compactness? So if you compute the gradient of the reduced parameterized objective function, then it's very similar to, to what we had, had before. Now we have minus this trace operator uh, times the adjoint state. And so what we would choose in order to apply this framework is we would choose M equal to our adjoint state and K equal to minus this trace operator. And this trace operator turns out to be compact. So this is good. So this is all what I wanted to uh, tell you about this boundary failure problem. Now I want to talk about bilinear control problem. So this is now fundamentally different from the previous two problems in that the control enters in a nonlinear fashion into the PDE. So we have the product of U times the state Y. And this is why it's called bilinear. And we have a few more technical assumptions on our domain. So it, it should be bounded polyhedral. Um, I, will, I will mention uh, in a few seconds why. Uh, we need a little bit more regularity of our random diffusion coefficient. So it should be continuously differentiable, not just continuous. And um, we have a, we require that the controls should be, should be non-negative and uh, bounded by, by some number B. And this also ensures that it's domain. So the domain of the is bounded. Okay, so here we also can compute gradients and it's a little bit more, um, more involved than for a semi-linear case. So here we have as a gradient, the product of an adjoint state and the solution operator. And we have imposed 
um, stronger conditions on the random diffusion coefficient as for the earlier problems. So we know that this product is actually in H1. So the product of the adjoint state and the PE solution is in H1. So this is why we can write a gradient as an evaluation of iota times this product. And iota is the embedding operator from H1 to L2. And yeah, so we would choose M equal to this product of the joint state and the PE solution and uh, K equal to Yota. And Yota is a compact operator which follows from solar gravity theory, for example. Yeah. And here are some numerical illustrations for, for the bilinear problem. So on the left, we can see uh, the solution to the nominal problem. And by nominal, I mean, uh, if you consider the optimization problem where we replace psi by its expected value. And on the right, an SAA problem with sample size n equal to 10. And they look a little bit different in particular towards the boundary. Um, yeah, and as we increase the sample size, uh, we can see that there's a difference in particular on the boundary. Okay. Um, yeah, now I would like to uh, summarize my talk. So we have talked about consistency analysis for risk neutral PD constraint optimization problems. And this has been made possible by exploiting problem structure, which I called hidden compactness, and their PDE stability estimates um, involved and also have optimality conditions. And optimality conditions also involve gradient computations. And what we have done on a less technical level is formalize the fact that solutions are not oscillatory in a sense. And so what we have done is um, analyze the consistency of SAA optimal values and SAA optimal solutions. And since these problems are non-convex, we would also be interested in our critical points or stationary points, um, but the analysis is, is very similar. So actually this compact set I've shown you earlier, it does not just in, contain the solutions, but also the SAA are critical points and stationary points. So it um, contains many interesting points that are relevant for optimization. And these are the references this talk is, is, is based on. So, yeah. Great, thank you. Could you maybe go back to the bilinear part? Because that was a little bit too fast for me. Uh, uh, to the problem formulation. Yeah, yeah so. Um, so you, do you, you really get the compactness that you need in this problem into the right spaces? I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't see okay, this. So it's, so um, and this is fundamentally different from, from the semilinear problem because we cannot make here explicit some compact operator okay. per se. Yeah. But if we uh, compute a gradient, mm -hmm. then we know it's the product of the adjoint state and the solution operator. Wow. So, and what do we know about this product? So if you have, for example, an, if you multiply an H1 function and an H2 function, then this product is an H1. Mm -hmm. This is some, yeah, some technical results on Sobolev spaces. Mm -hmm. So if I would, I, I already know that the adjoint state is an H1 function, right, by definition. Mm -hmm. And using these technical assumptions on, on Kappa here, on the domain and on psi, it's possible to show that S of U of psi is an element in H2. So U is in, in, uh, in L2. L2, well, actually, technically in L infinity, right? Oh, yeah, but I don't use this. Um, so U here um, should, or yeah, in order to make this, uh, this uh, bilinear PDE well-defined, 
it is helpful to know that um, U takes no negative values. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's just natural to, to impose, impose right. an upper bound. Right. And then it's if you know that this product is an H1, you can write it as the evaluation of, of Yota of this product. Mm -hmm. And this is possible because Yota uh, does nothing with objects from H1. Yeah. So if you evaluate Yota at V and V is an H1, then it will return V. Mm -hmm. So this is why I can write uh, this identity here. Wow. This is, uh, it uses the special, uh, special, uh, special form of, of how Yota is defined. It's very hidden in that sense. It is very hidden yeah. because, in, because you, if you stare at this PDE, you wouldn't recognize this compactness. Mm. So it's revealed after gradient computations and using PDE and regularity and, and mm. uh, calculus for, for products in this case. And, but this is also exploited, um, this higher regularity for finite element error estimates. And I was wondering, I mean, this is sort of the first step in the, the numerical analysis uh, of these problems, right? You need to have consistency first, and then you start deriving things like uh, error bounds and rates of convergence. Yeah. So Vanna Wimish and I have, at least for this uh, elliptic, linear elliptic case, we have uh, a full, let's say, error bound in the mesh and the, the sample. Uh, is it possible to get something like this here as well? Um, so I, I haven't thought about combining uh, these considerations with finite elements mm -hmm. and just error discretizations. Um, but yes, I think so, that it would be uh, possible to generalize it. Mm -hmm. So because the only, um, it appears that not, it's not important to know that the problem is, for example, strongly convex. Mm -hmm. What seems to be important is to, to have these fixed point type equations. Mm -hmm. And once you have these fixed point type equations that relate your control to the proximity operator of some constant times the gradient, and you know that the gradient has higher regularity, that it seems to be all, it seems to be the crucial problem structure that is needed to analyze these problems. Really? Okay. Yeah, because if you, if we have a look at finite element error estimates, yeah. um, there's, uh, there's much literature for semilinear problems, for example, and bilinear problems. And um, yeah, this fixed point type equation appears to be the most critical part because it uh, tells you that uh, your solutions have higher regularity for specific problems. Yeah. Um, the analyses are usually more demanding for non convex problems, but they use similar ideas or, or similar problem structure that is also found in nonlinear problems. And problem structure constraint optimization is often some compactness. Yeah. But you also need some kind of local uh, quadratic growth to be able to get these stability estimates, right? Yes. So yeah, so I don't have an so if you have this alpha positive in the problem formulation, mm -hmm. and then this gives you a fixed point type equation for your control. Yeah. But I don't have an intuition yet uh, why the specific term appears to be very crucial. So like this alpha half times the norm of u squared. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it, it seems to be very convenient because it gives you these fixed point type equations, but uh, I have not de yet developed an intuition for why this appears to be very, very crucial or helpful. Yeah, Other other questions? Rami? So um, have you considered the controls that are defined on like uh, on an on a inclusion that with a, with a gap greater than one, so like not on the boundary, but on like sort of one D line or a point in the domain, because then like then you cannot use H one, but maybe you can still use this framework with like other spaces than H one. Yeah. So I haven't done that, that yet. Um, so I, I considered so the the, the problems I I've, uh, I 
I've considered or I, 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 I talked about today, they are inspired from the literature on finite element error estimates. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, I somehow, it, it seems to be that whenever you're able to analyze finite element error estimates, that you would also be able to analyze other forms of perturbations. Um, so I think whenever, yeah, a finite element error analysis would be possible, for example, uh, then um, the sample average approximation scheme could also be analyzed. Yeah, and for more general forms, you would have, you would have more, I think more, the problems you've mentioned are this compact operator would be a more, a more complex one, I guess. Yeah. So it would not, not not be like a standard object uh, that that appears, for example, in Sobolev embedding theorems. Yeah, but maybe like I I've seen finite element analysis for these type of problems, but not the, not for the nonlinear case, just for the linear case. Uh, but for control as well, because I mean, yeah. so I'm, I'm guessing you're in the background of this question is related to these three D one D problems yeah, that yeah. people are, are interested in here, where you have this coupling between a three D problem and and one D. Uh, problems that sort of live on embedded uh, n minus uh, two dimensional manifolds embedded in R3. Okay. And so it's like a control problem that most people actually in our community haven't really looked at, right? We've done boundary control and control on portions of the domain, but not so much uh, looking at inverse problems and, and, and control on, on, let's say, small sort of lines looping their way through three space. The literature I've but, seen is not for uncertainty. So yeah, that's, and that's, and that's definitely true. I don't think anybody has looked at uncertainty. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And the, but then like they use like these weighted spaces and then there is a trace operator oh, into yeah. and to that line and to l2 of the line or l2 of the inclusion and i think this trace operator is also compact from these spaces but i'm i'm not 100 percent sure so i was just like wondering if you can like apply it sort of in this framework and just get the result so yeah i have done so and i'm not not familiar with this with these problem formulations Other questions? Seeing none, tell us time to speak again. See you all next year. <laughs>